I'm wanting to spend a little bit of time just walking you through the evening prayer liturgy. It's a liturgy that's perhaps the most underutilized of the liturgies, uh, the morning, evening prayer and Eucharist liturgies. And so just want you to be clear on how we lead evening prayer in a in a in a in a corporate context. So not just evening prayer privately at home on your own, but evening prayer that would take place in a church. So I'm just going to walk you through it step by step and point out key rubrics um, and and places and ways in which we would lead uh, such a service. Um, I'm, I'm sticking quite carefully to the rubrics that are in the Anglican prayer book, because these are our, our guidelines as to what we can and uh, and what, what we should do and then what's optional. Um, but what I'm also going to share with you are just, I guess, some of my own approaches to how I might lead an evening prayer service. So we start on page 54, and if you have your prayer book with you, you may want to just jot down some notes um, in it or next to it. Every now and again, you'll see um, some notes from me. The first thing that I just want to remind us all about are the rubrics. And the rubrics are these small texts that you see, for example, here at paragraph 44, that are written in, in small print. And they're called rubric. Uh, it's the Latin word for red, because in the old uh, versions of our prayer books, the, uh, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, and then the South African Book of, of uh, Common Prayer, uh, these would have been printed in red, let, in red ink. Um, and so now we now we just have black and white. Um, but these, in a sense, give us the options. These are the small, it's like the fine print that allows you to make a choice between what you do. And if you are a lay minister, um, you have, or at least you should have, just check this out with 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 your with your rector, but you should have the right and the privilege as a licensed lay minister to exercise your own judgment about how you want to do things based on these rubrics. So these rubrics give you legitimate options and you should feel free to be able to exercise judgment um, into quite how you want to uh, run the service and, uh, and the options you want to exercise. So we start at the beginning here, paragraph 42, with uh, the traditional welcome, um, followed by uh, the invitation to worship. This can be said um, on your own, as it says, the minister may say. Um, may means that you don't have to, you could leave it up, but ordinarily we would start with this. And uh, sometimes this is a nice thing for us to say together, and so you could invite people, uh, let us say, paragraph 43 together. Then we have this uh, important little guideline here, paragraph 44. The minister may read the appropriate sentence in section 86, and then the people respond. So again, may you'll see the word may coming up again and again it's just an option that's what you've been given here so here we have the option to read a sentence and you'll see i've added my own little rubric rubric uh, page 64 and you may want to do that i also have that uh, section flagged and so i'm going to pop quickly down to page 64 uh, if if this uh, screen will allow me to do things quickly there we go so here's page 64 with the sentences and what you'll see here is that we have these sentence that are, sentences that are set for particular times of the year. And so we would ordinarily use those during those special times. And then over here, we have um, sentences that can be said on certain days of the week. And on the next page, which I've not scanned, uh, you'll have a bunch of additional options that uh, to select from. So before the service starts, you would pick uh, the sentence that you wanna say, um, in my Bible, I have a little tab on that page, a little um, one of those little stickies, so that I can get to it quickly and then get back to uh, where I want to be. So you would read out that sentence, and then we would respond, let us worship and praise him. And during Eastertide, um, which is from Easter to Pentecost, we would also say, Alleluia. Then we have these responses. Um, and again, just note the, the rubric, the small print here, that during Lent, we typically omit the Alleluia. So we would say praise the Lord, but we would leave out Alleluia. Then we have uh, two options for a canticle, uh, Come Bless the Lord, which uh, is part of the morning prayer, and Hail Gladdening Light, which is a lovely old hymn. And this is the only uh, service in which this particular hymn appears. And so it's one that I... I like to use quite regularly because it is distinctive. It's one of those uh, canticles that we don't have anywhere else. 
there are no options here in the rubric at paragraph 46 to do another canticle, but sometimes people might replace these canticles with another canticle, and uh, you should probably feel free to exercise that discretion. Then we come to the penitence, which is very much the same as in morning prayer, and we would invite the congregation to silence. Um, it would be uh, the, the collective um, uh, prayer of confession, and then if there is a priest available, they would read this out, or perhaps everybody would say this uh, together. Again, note that the rubric here, this act of penitence may be omitted if an act of penitence is made at the Eucharist or another office during the day. So if earlier in the day, you as a congregation um, said uh, the penitence, for example, at the Eucharist, and now you're gathering together for evening prayer, then you could leave it out. But if this is the first service that you're running during the day, for example, um, the Monday of Holy Week, uh, perhaps you're using the evening prayer office and there was no service earlier in the day at church, then you would keep it, right? So just think a bit about not what people may have done on their own, but rather what we have done collectively. We then move into the word of God. Um, and paragraph 53 says that when this is the main Sunday service, all three readings set for the Eucharist are used, in which case the first reading comes before the psalm, the second reading at paragraph 55, and the third at paragraph 59. So here's the options. If if you did not have a, more, a, a Eucharist service in the morning, you would use the Eucharistic readings in the evening according to that rubric. And so that means you may want to write in some notes about what appears where. Uh, but if if you've had a morning Eucharist um, and you're now doing an evening prayer, then you would follow what we have here, which is the psalm. Uh, then we have the first reading. And here I think it's important just to notice how we introduce and conclude the readings. Uh, we open the reading by saying the first lesson written in, and we read out where that first lesson is, very often an Old Testament reading. Um, and then at the end of the reading, instead of saying, here the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, we simply say, here ends the first lesson. And so try to remember to keep to the, um, the liturgy that we have for the evening prayer that is different from the morning liturgy. Here is an option for a bit of silent meditation at rubric 56. Uh, in some uh, contexts, you may want to spend a bit of time reflecting. And so quite often, uh, so our Lay ministers meet every Saturday morning for a morning prayer service. And at this point, we would share some reflections on the reading that we've just had. What does it say to us? What are we hearing God saying to us? And we would share for five minutes or so um, some of our thoughts, and then we would move on. Then you have the option here to say either the Song of Mary or another canticle. So ordinarily, we would say the Song of Mary we would read it as is here as a, a, a group. Um, of course, you could do it by alternate verses. You could do it by half verses. So responsively, there's different ways that you could mix, mix it up a little bit. And again, as a lay minister, this is at your discretion how you would like to do that. Um, you'll see that I've made a little note here for myself. Again, my own, my own personal rubrics that the Advent anthems which are said in the days leading up to Advent can be done. And you'll find that at paragraph 87. And so if you'd like to use those, this is once a year, there's this very brief time in, in Advent where we can say these additional um, um, anthems. I thought I would just mention here, because I think sometimes we might miss um, the importance of this, but in the evening prayer liturgy, we say the Song of Mary. And you should know that in the morning prayer liturgy, we say the Song of Zechariah. And there's a beautiful symmetry in the way that these two songs are put together into these two prayers. Zechariah, of course, was the father of John, who was the herald of the Messiah, the forerunner, the last of the prophets to foretell the coming of the Messiah. Mary is the mother of the Son of God, the mother of Jesus, and uh, she then has this song that she sings about her son. So in the morning, we have the song about the forerunner of Christ, the one that we look forward to coming from the perspective of John's father, Zechariah. And there's this promise, you, my son, will be the prophet of the Most High because you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. That's what we do in the morning as we wake up. We anticipate the coming of Christ. 
And then in our evening prayer, which we could, may often do just before we go to bed, we have the Song of Mary, which then celebrates what Christ is going to do now that he has been born and come into the world. And there's a wonderful, wonderful kind of opening and closing, the beginning and the end, the prophecy, and then the fulfillment of that between these two glorious, glorious hymns. And so my own preference is always to keep the Song of Mary here and the Song of Zechariah in the morning. They're, they are such great um, reminders of the development of our faith. We then move on to the second scripture reading. Uh, again, the second lesson is written in, and then you read the reading, and at the end, here ends the second lesson. There's no response from the congregation. Again, silence may be kept, or if, you, if you're in a smaller group particularly, there may be um, a bit of uh, sharing and reflection. Uh, or if you don't want to do a sermon later on, you could, you could preach a very short homily here, just kind of share a few thoughts of your own um, as the lay minister or, in, or the priest may do this. And then we have another canticle, the Song of Simeon, very, very short canticle. Again, read the rubric. You are allowed to have another canticle that you can draw from later in the prayer book. Uh, where are those? Those are sitting um, in the 300s, if I remember correctly. Yep, so about 300 and, uh, let's see if I can find the first one there quickly. Page 341 onwards are the, the other canticles, and you can select one of those instead. Um, or you could sing a hymn or chorus in place. Then we move into the, the creed, and there's a rubric here again, paragraph 63. So that's why I'm, I'm doing this little recording, is just to remind you of how important the rubrics are. They are in small print, but you shouldn't skip over them. You're not going to read them out loud, but you need to be really familiar with them, and you need to have decided before the service how you're going to use them in this particular service. So let's read paragraph 63 says that if the creed has been used at the Eucharist or the morning prayer earlier in the day. And so what this is referring to is an actual Eucharist service or a morning prayer service. Then the baptismal creed at paragraph 65, which is over here, is used in place of the Apostles' Creed. So you will notice that we have three options for creeds. We have the Nicene Creed, which we do at the Eucharist. We have the Apostles' Creed, which we can do here in the morning and evening prayer. And then we have the baptismal creed, which we can do in the evening. So if in the morning at a Eucharist or at the morning prayer, we use the Nicene or the Apostles' Creed, then in the evening prayer, we don't repeat the creed. Instead, we use the short baptismal creed, which comes straight from the baptismal lit lit liturgy. And so just be clear on which one you're doing. I've sometimes seen people do both. And that's, of course, what we don't, we don't need to do both. Uh, what we're really doing, we're just reaffirming our faith. And if we have multiple services um, during one day, uh, we would use the shorter and shorter versions as we go on. Paragraph 66 leads us into the time of prayer, very similar to evening prayer, to morning prayer, my apologies. Uh, that leads into the Lord's Prayer, into the prayers at paragraph 69 or 70. Again, these are the same prayers that we would have used in morning prayer. We then have the collect of the day. Uh, if and, and again at see paragraph 71, this may be omitted if evening prayer immediately precedes or follows the Eucharist, because in the Eucharist we would say the collect of the day. So if if this immediately precedes or follows the Eucharist, uh, we could skip it out. But there is no harm in saying the collect of the day multiple times during the day. The collects really pull together and help deepen our understanding of the the message and the and the theme of the day. That leads us into the Collect for Peace and the Evening Collect. Um, they're written here as, as, as being said by the, the minister or the leader of the service uh, with the congregation just saying amen at the end. But again, there's no reason why you couldn't have the congregation saying this as a collective prayer together. And then we have the grace. And then very much as we would have in the morning prayer, there's an opportunity for the evening prayer to end here or for us to have a sermon. And then there's these options for the second part of the prayers. And you'll see that there's various ways that people will do this. Sometimes they'll say they'll replace the first part with the second part. Sometimes they'll just do the first part and end here. Sometimes they'll do first part 
sermon and then it's the second part and then come back and conclude with the grace it's really kind of up to you to see how you weave that together depending on the time uh, the needs of your congregation I think it's also interesting just again to note the the uh, the way in which the prayers in the second part are structured according to the rubric. So um, we have here in paragraph 79, the minister leads the thanksgiving in which the congregation may be invited to join, after which we say one or both of the following, blessing and honor and thanksgiving and praise, and then God of all power, we acclaim you, Lord of all grace, we worship you. So this paragraph 79 is inviting us to say prayers of thanksgiving, not prayers of supplication uh, or prayers of intercession. The, the, these prayers, paragraph 79, 80, 81, are really thanksgiving prayers. And then you'll see at paragraph 82 on the next page, now the minister leads the intercession and petition in which the congregation may be invited to join. And so we have these two, in the second part, we actually have part A and part B. Part A at paragraph 79 are prayers of thanksgiving. And after having given thanks in the second part of paragraph 82, we have our prayers of intercession and petition. And then this leads into these last prayers um, of intercession and petition. This paragraph 83 is such a beautiful prayer. This is the only place in our prayer book where it appears. Um, preserve us, Lord, while waking, and guard us while sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. It's such a lovely prayer, a great prayer for us to say as we climb into bed and switch off the light. Um, we would then go into, uh, may the Lord bless us and watch over us, and then can be finished by a blessing. Quite often we'll say the grace here, um, and then if, if the priest is in the house, um, they can end with the peace of God that passes all understanding and conclude the service in that way. I hope that you'll find this little uh, tutorial or instructed evening prayer useful in just thinking a bit about how you prepare. I guess a key part of what I'm inviting you to be attentive to are the rubrics um, and to read the rubrics regularly, to not skip over them. And then as you prepare to lead an evening prayer service, just as you would for morning prayer, uh, to make sure that you have decided beforehand what you're going to do and which options you're going to exercise. And so I pray God's blessing on you as you prepare uh, evening prayer liturgies. Blessings.